Hello, this is Lon Nguyen, and along with me is my colleague, Jenny Mojica. We are thrilled to be here today with you to discuss H2As and H2Bs for the 2020 season. We are going to be looking at um, some updates for both of the programs and also discuss trends that we are seeing for the H2A and H2B program. Before we start, though, I just want to go over some housekeeping matters. Um, for questions during the presentation, please hover over the bottom of the screen to see a chat feature. Feel free to type in your questions as we present, and we will be sure to respond to them um, during the presentation or at the end of the presentation. Also, should the internet audio cut out, please use the dial-in number provided. In addition to this webinar, we will also be holding a future webinar on H-1Bs and J waivers in the future. So please be on the lookout for those uh, webinar announcements because we hope you can join us for those webinars also. So we're going to start now and um, talk about the H-2A and H-2B program. And what we're going to do is provide you with an overview of the two programs to determine which program is best for your temporary need. Um, there are new changes in the H-2A and H-2B program, what the Department of Labor has described as H-2A modernization and H-2B modernization. The procedures are a little bit different and we'll provide you with an overview of the procedures for both programs. Um, we're also going to talk about the employer's obligations here uh, for employers who participate in the H-2A and H-2B program. Anytime an employer seeks a benefit from the government, there are obligations that they must abide by, and that is because there is a compliance component to both of these programs, um, and in order to uh, comply with those requirements, it's really important to understand the potential consequences of what would happen if you don't comply with the requirements of the two program. Um, the Department of Labor will conduct audits along with other types of investigations, um, such as the one by the Wage and Hour Division investigation, and also the Immigration Service, USCIS, is now also part of the compliance program for these two programs. Uh, USCIS is now conducting what we call FDNS, Fraud Detection National Security Audits Investigations of H2 B and H-2A employers, and this is a recent development within the last, I would say, um, two to three years that we've really seen this increase by the Immigration Service. So we'll also discuss that with you. The question that we often get when we get a call from a client is, what is the most appropriate program for my need? Um, the H-2A program is for temporary agricultural workers, and the H-2B program is for temporary non-agricultural workers. And that is a conversation that we always have at the onset of a case as we're trying to determine uh, your options for work visas. The H-2A, um, even though it's described as agriculture, there are definitions of agriculture that expands beyond just farming or the traditional um, agricultural activities, uh, which include dairy, um, ranches, um, agricultural farms. The Department of Labor has also recognized secondary agricultural activities as a basis for H-2A work visas. Um, recently, there was a decision, ATP Agri-Services, that really threw a loop in the H-2A program for some employers uh, where the Department of Labor made a decision that um, it 
transportation um, services, trucking services, where uh, trucking companies uh, were involved in the delivery of agricultural products if they were not uh, a farmer or um, considered to be participating in farming services would not qualify under the H-2A program. And this impacted many uh, H-2A employers who have relied on the H-2A visa program for many years um, to, to obtain the workers they needed to drive their trucks to pick up agricultural products um, produced by farmers. And so we are still looking at how the Department of Labor and the courts will interpret this definition. Um, we are seeing denials by um, some of the cases that ha have been recently processed by the Department of Labor, but there are some cases that have been approved too. And so it's really important to um, consult with counsel as to how you want to frame the H-2A petitions where you're doing what is considered secondary agricultural services or um, secondary agricultural activities, whether it fits under the H-2A definition or not. For the H-2B definition, it's really anything that's non-agriculture where you can establish a temporary need. And we will go in depth as to what the various definitions of temporary need um, consists of under the H-2B program later. For now, I'm going to turn it over to Jenny because she's going to go over the H-2A Temporary Agricultural Work Visa program with you. Thanks, Lon. So for a position to qualify for H-2A classification, the work has to be temporary, so in other words, not year-round, or seasonal, meaning it's tied to a certain time of year when you can document that you have an increased need for help. Uh, the process includes a market test to document that there are no qualified, willing, able, or available U.S. workers to fill a temporary role, and it involves uh, three steps. Uh, the first step is the filing of a temporary labor certification with the U.S. Department of Labor. The second step involves the filing of a non-immigrant visa petition with a different agency, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. And the third step involves, for most cases, the processing for an H-2A visa at a U.S. embassy or consulate abroad. And we're going to talk about all three steps in a little bit more detail. So first, uh, the first step, the temporary labor certification, this is done, again, through the Department of Labor. The purpose of the labor certification step is to ensure that there's not going to be any adverse impact to U.S. workers through the employment of these foreign H-2A workers but also to ensure that U.S. workers, if available, are being offered uh, the available temporary work, and also to ensure that the foreign workers that are being brought in as temporary workers are going to be treated fairly and given reasonable employment conditions, including proper wages, housing, food, and transportation. As Lon introduced earlier, the Department of Labor has made great strides in modernizing the process by providing employers with a technological platform called flag.gov, from which uh, employers are able to file all applications associated with this first step, and also by recently streamlining the recruitment or market test requirements, and we'll talk about those in, in sequence. Um, the labor certification step itself involves three sub-steps because, uh, like all things immigration, it's complicated. Uh, but the first step involves the filing of Form ETA-790 with the State Workforce Agency. And the ETA-790 is essentially a job order that contains all of the duties of the position, the requirements, the employer's terms and conditions of the job, and clarifies what the employer will provide to the workers in terms of pay, hours per week of work, transportation, lodging, et cetera. Uh, the ETA 790, or job order, is intended to put workers on notice about the terms and conditions of the job, but also encourage them to apply. The employer has to file the ETA 790 75 to 60 days before you need the worker to start. So for example, if you need someone to start April 1st, the earliest that you'd be able to file the ETA 790 is January 17th, and the latest that you'd be able to file is February 1st. So timing does, in fact, matter. Uh, once the state workforce agency clears the job order, you get to move on to the second sub-step, 
and file the actual labor certification application with the Department of Labor on another form 9142A. And you file that form along with supplemental statements concerning the temporary and seasonal nature of, of your need. So on account of the Department of Labor's modernization efforts and the launching of flag.gov, uh, employers are now able to file both the ETA 790 and Form 9142A on flag.gov, whereas before employers had to use different platforms to file those applications. Uh, and even more uh, interestingly, uh, flag.gov allows the two applications to talk to each other. So, for example, when you're working in Form 9142A, employers are now able to pull up and insert into the form the job order and related data, which functionality is intended to streamline the prop process and reduce the amount of time spent on the 9142A. It's also intended to ensure consistency between those two applications. And then now onto the third subset of the labor certification application. Once the 9142A has been accepted by DOL for processing, the recruitment phase of the process starts. Now the re recruitment phase used to require the employer to initiate engage, and engage in recruitment steps proactively and on its own. However, new recruitment rules were published in the Federal Register on September 20th and those rules are intended to modernize and improve the reliability of the market test while at the same time uh, reduce the burden on employers. So under the new rules, employers are no longer required to place ads in the newspaper. DOL instead will advertise the job opportunity on an electric job registry called seasonaljobs.gov. Uh, DOL is also going to place a copy of the job order on the registry, and that job order will remain posted automatically until 50% of the requ requested H-2A time or contract time has elapsed. DOL is also going to use its own channels and resources to disseminate the job information to try to reach a larger candidate pool. And um, despite uh, DOL taking these proactive steps on behalf of the employer, uh, the new rules still do al allow the Department of Labor to ask the employer to perform additional recruitment steps on a proactive basis in up to three states if the Department of Labor deems the extra recruitment to be necessary to solicit more candidates. The Department of Labor will notify the employer of any extra recruitment steps when it issues its notice of acceptance of the labor certification application. So these new rules went into effect on Monday, October 21st, and we will definitely keep employers updated as we begin to work with the new rules and, and as we're working on new H-2A applications this year. So that's the first step of the game. Uh, let's move on to the second step of the H-2A process. And once uh, the Department of Labor certifies the labor certification application, or 9142, the employer gets to move on to file the I-129 non-immigrant visa petition with now with a different agency, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. Uh, in this petition, the employer again describes the temporary and seasonal agricultural need, how many workers are needed for the role, where the workers were processed for a visa, and it includes a copy of the labor certification application uh, approved by the Department of Labor itself. If the employer prepares a petition for unnamed workers, there's no uh, need to include evidence of the worker's qualifications for the role. However, if uh, workers are named in that I-129 petition, the employer has to uh, shore up evidence that the workers do in fact qualify for the role. So unlike most other visa categories, uh, the Immigration Service does provide expedited processing of H-2A petitions at no additional charge which means typically that USCIS will process H-2A applications in around 15 days. And then on to step three, uh, once USCIS approves uh, the non-immigrant visa petition, uh, the H-2A worker will then use that approval notice to apply for an H-2A passport visa at the U.S. Embassy or Consulate Abroad, and they will make that application on Form DS-160. The only workers that are not required to obtain a visa are workers from Canada, as Canadians are not required to obtain passport visas before applying for admission into the United States. 
Uh, for all others, uh, the embassy or consulate will have to adjudicate the, the visa application of the worker. The embassy will review the worker's eligibility for the job and for admission into the United States. They will issue the visa and then the worker will present him or herself at the border um, with the visa to apply for admission into the United States in H-2A status. And it is the individual's admission into the United States in H-2A status that confers upon them the right to work and remain in the United States for the approved period of time. Okay, let's talk for a bit about employer assurances and obligations. If an employer wants to participate in the H-2A program, it's subject to certain obligations to its workers and it has to make those known uh, to the workers as a part of the recruitment and notice process. Uh, we've listed in the, the PowerPoint presentation um, a number of these obligations and ass assurances, um, but given the time, we're gonna only talk about a select few um, all of the obligations are also listed in our handouts uh, that were provided as a part of this webinar. So first, and I think most importantly, recruitment has to be conducted for the role and left running until 50% of the requested H-2A time is complete. And if as a result of that recruitment, qualified, able, willing, and available U.S. workers apply for the job, the employer has to be able to document it offered those individuals the job. Uh, so, just to put things into a little bit of context, if you petition for workers uh, from April 1 to November 1, you have to show that you recruited and offered qualified U.S. workers the role up until August 1st. Uh, as a part of the H-2A program, you have to provide free housing for those whose residence is not within commuting distance from the work site. Uh, the employer has to provide workers' compensation and provide tools, supplies, and equipment necessary to do the job. The employer has to provide uh, cooking and eating facilities or three meals a day and provide or make available transportation to and from the work site. It also has to guarantee wages for at least three fourths of uh, the time uh, or the contract uh, regardless of whether unexpected events prevent the work from being completed so if you're, again, requesting um, a validity period of April 1 to August 1, and there's a massive flood uh, that prevent, prevents the workers from doing any work on the farm whatsoever, the employer would still be required to pay the H-2A worker wages through July 1. The employer also has to provide a record of earnings uh, to the H-2A worker, to all H-2A workers as a part of the process and the employer has to pay the highest of adverse effect wage rate, which is the minimum wage that the U.S. Department of Labor has determined must be offered and paid to the U.S. and alien workers. Uh, the prevailing wage, the prevailing peace rate, the agreed upon collective bargaining wage, if applicable, or the minimum wage. Also of note and important to, to many is that the employer is responsible for all legal fees, um, all attorney fees, visa fees, fees associated with the process. Um, they also are subject to several reporting requirements. The petitioners have to submit to the Department of Labor a recruitment report identifying the steps taken, who applied for the role, whether or not they were any qualified U.S. workers, whether or not any U.S. workers were hired, and they have to submit that report by a date set by the Department of Labor, even if all the recruitment has not yet been completed. Um, if you find yourself in a situation where you're submitting a report and your recruitment has not yet been completed, then you will have to submit a supplemental recruitment report once all the recruitment has been completed. Uh, in addition, petitioners uh, of H-2A workers have to notify USCIS um, of the occurrence of certain events within two work days. Uh, it has to notify USCIS if the H-2A worker fails to report to work within five work days of the latter of the employment start date on the H-2A petition or the start date established by the petitioner. Uh, if the H-2A worker leaves without notice and fails to report for work for five consecutive work days without the consent of the employer, 
if the H-2A worker is terminated before completing uh, the H-2A labor or services, or the H-2A worker finishes the labor or services for which he or she was hired more than 30 days earlier than the date specified in the H-2A petition. Uh, the H-2A program also requires the employer to maintain an audit file regarding the process for a period of three years from either the date of certification of the labor certification by the Department of Labor or the date of determination if the application for labor certification is denied or withdrawn. And that audit file must include um, a number of, uh, of pieces of information and documents, including proof of the employer's recruitment efforts, evidence that the employer has reached out to former U.S. workers who filled the role in previous season uh, to ask them uh, to apply for the job or return to work, resumes, applications, uh, and other correspondence uh, that applications uh, of workers were considered and analyzed, uh, the required uh, aforementioned recruitment reports, proof of workers' compensation insurance, uh, records of each employee's uh, earnings, and a copy of the certified labor certification application. I'm now going to turn it over to Lon to talk about the H-2B temporary non-agricultural worker visa. Thank you so much, Jenny. So the H-2B temporary non-agricultural worker visa program, um, there are similarities with the H-2A program, but the biggest difference that is glaring to many of us who um, work with H-2B visas is that um, unlike the H-2A program, the H-2B visa program, there is a numerical cap on the number of visa applications or visas issued to employers. So with the H-2A program, there's no cap on the number of H-2A workers that are allowed in the U.S. For the H-2B program, there is a cap of 66,000 work visas per fiscal year. And the way the government divides up the 66,000 66,000 number uh, of visas is um, for the first half is from October to March where it reserves 33,000 work visas for the first six months of the fiscal year and the second half of the fiscal year is from April through the end of September where the remaining 33,000 visa numbers are reserved. What we've seen in the last five years or more is that there simply are not enough H-2B work visas available to meet the needs of U.S. employers. For example, last year, um, on January 1st, which is the earliest date that an employer can file for an H-2B petition with a start date of April 1st, which is the beginning of the second half of the fiscal year, the Department of Labor received enough H-2B petitions for 80,000 workers, meaning U.S. employers were seeking 80,000 plus H-2B work visas for the second half of the fiscal year. I just shared with you there's only 33,000 visa numbers available. So our advice for any employer who is looking at participating or who will be participating in the H-2B program for the 2020 season starting April 1st is to go in it with your eyes wide open with the reality that you as an employer may not get one of the 33,000 visa numbers available. As such, it's important to have a plan B, but also to also discuss with your council options that you may have in finding workers who may be already in the U.S. in H-2B status. For those workers who are currently in the U.S., they've already been counted against the cap and if an employer is able to hire them, they are not required to obtain a new H-2B visa, so they're exempt from the H-2B visa cap. So that's something to consider as you go forth preparing for 
um, the April 2020 season here. Uh, we are already in the midst of preparing for H2B season, as we call it, uh, for many employers in the country. It, it, the spring season is when they bring in H-2B workers. And so um, right now there are still H-2B visas available for the first half of the fiscal year, which means any start date between October 1st through March 31st. Um, right now there are still H-2B visas available, but we expect them to run out or to be used up probably by the end of November, um, of this November, based on the current count we have from the Immigration Service. Another consideration for the H-2B program and the H-2A program is that your beneficiaries, the workers that you bring over under these two programs, have to be nationals or citizens of eligible countries noted by the federal government. Each year, the federal government issues in the Federal Register a list of H-2B and H-2B, H-2B and H-2A eligible countries. So it's really critical that you look at that list to make sure that the workers that you're bringing over are nationals on that list. There are exemptions. It's difficult to get, but possible. And um, if you are in a situation where you need workers from a country not on the list, uh, again, I, I recommend you seek counsel in regards to that. Uh, similar to the H-2A program, you do have to establish temporary need for the H-2B workers. The definition of temporary need is a little bit different from the H-2A program, and I will discuss that um, later on. The, there will be new DOL processing procedures as part of the H-2B modernization program that the Department of Labor is currently reviewing. Um, there were proposed regulations that are being finalized right now which will change the program um, in the future, but nothing effective for the coming season that we see right now or that we know of at this time. We're going to talk now about temporary need. Um, under the H-2B program, there are four categories of temporary need that an employer can establish or meet in order to show their temporary need. The first definition is um, one-time occurrence. And, and under this definition, it's for a situation where the employer usually does not employ an individual in this type of position, but may need this person or um, a group of individuals for a one-time need only. Some examples include, for example, um, a software engineer who uh, invented a software application program and um, the employer may need him in the U.S only for a specific time period in order to train individuals on that application or to um, basically roll it out for use among users. That's one example. Um, we had an example years ago when um, there was a need for workers to come in to fix um, windmills um, and basically it was a one-time need due to the special um, the special materials being used by the employer and that would be a, another situation. The one-time occurrence um, definition is also very different in that usually you cannot bring H-2B workers in for more than 10 months. Anything over 10 months it's a red flag to the Department of Labor that it does not meet the temporary need definition. For one-time occurrence, you can bring the individual um, in for up to three years. Now, the Department of Labor will only approve the petition for one-year increments, but you can make the request year after year for up to three years. It's rare, but it's done. 
um, in the past. Um, another example that I'll share because we often get asked about it is for nannies. Um, we had a situation where the individual needed a nanny only for a specific period of time due to the family situation and um, we were able to get the nanny in under this temporary need of one-time occurrence. The second definition that you see there is seasonal need and that need is very similar to what we see in the H2A context also where the need is tied to a season of the year by an event or a pattern of recurring nature. So under this definition, you have to show to the Department of Labor that you only may have need for these workers up to 10 months a year, and for the rest of the year, you don't have any workers in such a position. So we see a lot of that in our resort industry where um, many of our resort up north in northern Minnesota or um, in northern Michigan, for example, they only have workers during the time period that they're open or when there's a tourist season, but they may not have the workers in the other months of the year. So that is under the definition of seasonal need. The third definition that we have available under the H2B program and it is very popular is peak load need. Um, this is a situation where an employer regularly employs permanent workers throughout the year, but during a period or a season, um, they need additional workers. Again, our resort workers also fall under this definition. Um, Sometimes we have landscape workers that also fall under this definition. The key is to show that um, you regularly employ individuals under this in this occupation, but you need more workers um, during the peak load season that you have. It can be based on operational needs or, as I mentioned, seasonal needs, where the Department of Labor has asked us to describe it in terms of need due to weather patterns so it won't be confused with seasonal need. There's also intermittent need. Um, I know of very few cases that have been filed under this definition. Um, there's not a, a lot of case law about this definition. Uh, an example that has been given to us regarding intermittent need is when you need to bring in a a worker to perform the services for only um, on an occasional basis, um, but it's not recurring, such as peak load or seasonal need. And an example that the Department of Labor has provided to us for this definition is, for example, a translator who may come in to translate materials and um, Every few years, you may need that translator to come in to update the translation. There was another example provided by the Department of Labor for t-shirt sellers during the Super Bowl season, for example, where you may not need um, them on a recurring nature, but on an intermittent need once in a while. Um, because the Super Bowl is not in the same state, for example, or the same work site for every year it moves around. So that was an example that was provided, but it's not one that is often used by employers here. The process for the H-2B program is um, very similar to the H-2A program uh, as of 2015 when the Department of Labor and the Immigration Service uh, issued joint interim regulations um, for the H-2B program. The um, Department of Labor is right now looking, as I mentioned, um, proposed regulations that will uh, change the procedures of the H-2B program. It's not effective yet. And um, so we're right now operating um, under the 2015 interim regulations for the H-2B program. 
And what happened in 2015 and why um, I mentioned the H-2A program, how it's similar is that some of the provisions that were previously only in the H-2A program were now um, in the requirements now appeared in the H-2B program after 2015, and I'll go through some of them. But for employers who are participating in the H-2B program or are interested in participating it, in it, um, this is the time now to start preparing for the H-2B uh, petition. And the reason is um, the first step in preparing the H-2B petition is to obtain a prevailing wage determination from the Department of Labor. And it takes the Department of Labor about 30 to 60 days. Right now we're looking at 30 days for the Department of Labor to issue a prevailing wage. So as I mentioned to you, um, the first filing date for a, a April 1st date of need this year coming up will be January 2nd. It's 90 days before uh, April 1st. And I think it's due to the leap year or something like that. Last year it was January 1st. But the reason we're starting now to get the prevailing wage determination is that if there are any issues with what the Department of Labor issue, issues back in regards to what it has determined as the, per, as the wage um, requirement for the petition or for the petition that you're looking to sponsor a H-2B worker, um, you still have time to submit a revised petition or wage determination. The wage determination is um, request is submitted via form ETA 9141. As Jenny mentioned previously, it's all through the flag program now. And um, we're getting good feedback, even though there are changes to the uh, program and anytime you use a new program there are difficulties but overall the feedback is that the flag program uh, or the software program that's being used has been um, user friendly and um, more or is easier to navigate even though there are still some issues that we have raised to the Department of Labor. So once an employer submits the prevailing wage request to the Department of Labor, um, we start preparing um, for establishing the temporary need of the H-2B uh, petition. And the second step of filing the H-2B uh, petition is to prepare the ETA 9142B. And as I mentioned earlier, um, it can't be filed more than 90 days before the date of need. Um, under this process here, that is when the employer really provides documentation of temporary need, and that may include uh, three years of revenues or um, charts regarding how many workers you've um, hired within the last three years in the specific position that you're seeking the H-2B petition. And during this period when uh, that we're in right now, we are working with employers to gather this documentation because um, you do not want to wait till the last minute to file a petition due to the limitation of H-2B visa numbers that I mentioned earlier, you want to make sure that by the time um, <clears throat> you file your petition on January 2nd, everything is in order and there is no room for a notice of deficiency to be requested, which will further delay the processing of the application and delay the employer getting to the stage where they can seek a H-2B visa. So um, that by the time we prepare the ETA 9142B, we want to have all that information uh, already prepared that I mentioned. Once you file the ETA 9142B, the Department of Labor will issue a notice of acceptance or 
um, notice of deficiency within one week of filing. That's what's noted under the regulations and on the Department of Labor website. But our experience is that it simply is not possible for that to happen due to the high volume of filings that the Department of Labor receives in, um, in January for the um, spring season. Uh, right now, for the applications that we are filing under the first half of the fiscal year, it's pretty standard that we will get a um, notice of acceptance or notice of deficiency within the first week of filing. The ETA 9141, the determination is filed along with the ETA 9142B, which is the actual H2B labor certification application and those are filed together um, via flag. Once the Department of Labor um, process the applications um, and issues certification of the H-2B petition, the next step is to file with the Immigration Service. Um, this is where it counts. This is where you want the visa numbers to be available. It's not the Department of Labor who issues the visa numbers that we are all um, basically trying to get here. Or um, uh, It's really the USCIS stage where the visa numbers are allocated. And so once you go through the Department of Labor stage and you go through the requirements of testing the labor market, um, if there are no visa numbers available, um, it's not possible to file with the USCIS an application unless you're seeking exempt workers. I should note that last year and the last couple of years, Congress has issued additional visa numbers, but usually they have not been available until June or July, which for some employers are too late when they have an April 1st need but we have seen a trend in that and hope that continues this year. You, we just can't bet on it though. And so I do want to share that information with you. So um, employers should not be discouraged from going through the first stage with the Department of Labor in case new numbers are released. You can then file with USCIS if you do need visa numbers. And um, the filing with the Immigration Service, an employer can request for premium processing, which is a fee of $1,410 for the Immigration Service to issue a decision within 15 days of filing. In, an employer can ask for consular processing or if they have workers in the U.S. already, they can seek an extension or a change of status for the individuals in the U.S. So um, what, what's interesting about the first two petitions I've discussed with you, the ETA 9142B with the Department of Labor and the USCIS I-129 form is that you don't have to provide specific names of the workers that you're bringing in. At these two stages, um, you don't have to know who your workers are yet uh, unless you are asking for individuals who are currently in the U.S., then you would file the petition as a name petition. It is only at that third stage of the uh, H-2B process of bringing in H-2B workers that you do need to know who your workers are, their names, and the reason is because the third step requires them to apply for the H-2B work visa at the U.S. consulate with jurisdiction over their residence. So we process a lot of workers, for example, through Monterey, and um, we bring those workers in and that is where each of the workers will need to apply for their own visa applications um, in order to enter the U.S. to work under the H-2B program. So I'm going to go now and talk about the program requirements. Um, we talked a lot about assurances and obligations that are required for the H-2B program. Um, the job offer needs to be a full-time uh, job, meaning it's a full-time employment situation for 35 hours at 
a week at minimum during that temporary period. We already talked about the offered wage. Um, the job order needs to, or the wage needs to equal or exceed the highest of the prevailing wage, which is, which is the ET, ETA 91, um, 9141 form that I previously mentioned that you submit to the Department of Labor. Um, it needs to be the highest of the prevailing wage, federal minimum wage, state minimum, minimum wage, or local minimum wage. Uh, and that is determined by the Department of Labor. An employer also has to reimburse the worker for transportation and subsistence. Um, if the worker completes 50% of the contract. And this is a provision that didn't exist or was not clearly understood before 2015. And after 2015, under the interim regs, it became clear, which mirrors the requirement of the H-2A program. Similar to the statement that um, the program now requires the employer to reimburse the worker in for visa processing fees or related fees incurred by the H-2B worker as part of the H-2B process. Um, of course, part of the H-2B process, similar to the H-2A program, is that the whole intent of it is to see if there are available U.S. workers to fill the positions that the U.S. employer needs during the um, employment period that they are seeking for. And so that is where the employer is required to test the labor market. And um, the Department of Labor will outline exactly what the employer needs to do in order to um, test the labor market. As part of the um, H-2B program, the requirements of the position being offered has to be customary. It cannot be uh, requirements that are not customary. And we've seen that w in situations where an employer may have um, a position that requires duties that may be considered um, duties of two occupation. The Department of Labor has pushed back and asked for documentation as to why is it customary to, for this position to be doing the duties of two different occupation. There's also a three-fourth guarantee requirement um, along with a requirement that all corresponding employee ease be paid the same and treated the same as the H-2B workers. Um, please note that right now the Department of Labor cannot enforce these provisions even though it's a even though these requirements do exist and they are legal requirements, the Department of Labor cannot enforce it. Um, the employer also has to provide and inform all H-2B workers of the um, of the details of the job, what the job entails and, and the requirements, um, and also the, uh, the hours offered. Um, I'm not going to go through each one of the requirements in detail because I want to make sure we get to the uh, basically a really important part of the program, which is the audit, the uh, program audits and investigations that often come with the filing of the H-2A and H-2B um, petitions. Alon, before we start on, on audits and investigations, there is a question from the audience and it relates to the availability of H-2B visas under the quota or cap. Mm -hmm. um, is the approval of these applications based on a first come, first serve basis is the question. So. Um, it's, it's changed. The Department of Labor, um, for those who participated last year, you may remember the fiasco where um, the, the ICERT program crashed. And um, prior to July 3rd of 2019, the procedures uh, by the Department of Labor was to process applications first in, first process. It didn't mean it was first approved or first out. And the reason I say it's not first out or first approved is because if it was being adjudicated and there were deficiencies with the petitions, it would further delay the petition being issued a certification. So definitely it was first in, 
first process. The Department of Labor will be changing that or has changed it as of um, July 3rd of 2019. It is going to be changed for 2020, and that's going to be a huge change for employers. Um, what that means is it comes down to luck. Um, the, under the new procedures, employers who file in the first three days, and it will be January 2nd, January 3rd, and January 4th, petitions that the Department of Labor receives on those first three days will be then disseminated to the various adjudicators. We're not quite sure how the Department of Labor will disseminate that, but our understanding is that the petitions received within those first three days will be divided up into Group A, B, and C. Group A will be petitions that uh, meet, at, meaning the number of petitions that can be in Group A will fulfill the 33,000 number of workers that we know there are visas available for the second half, and the Department of Labor will process or work on those applications first. A lot of people have used the term lottery, and yes, it is about whether you're chosen or not by luck, but it's not an official lottery where they're um, putting the applications in some type of computer-generated program or anything like that that we're aware of, but um, it isn't gonna be first in, first out or first in, first process anymore. It's just gonna be uh, basically random a random dissemination of the applications received in the first three days for um, in January 2020 this year. So it's going to be very different. And I have concerns about that because the Department of Labor, um, their funding has decreased along with the fact that with this decision, the ATP decision, where you had employers filing H-2A petitions, uh, they are thinking that now they have to file H-2B uh, petitions for some of these activities that were previously considered secondary agricultural activity. It's going to now fall probably under the H-2B category for some of them. So I do want us to address um, best practices for program audits and wage and hour investigations. We've seen a huge increase in wage and hour investigations. Also, program audits were restarted. Um, they stalled for a couple of years after 2015, and they restarted again um, in 2017. So um, we want to go over that with you. The enforcement authority of the Department of Labor is in the regulations. It's definitely um, one that this current administration has really um, advocated on based on buy American, hire American. And so what we've seen is an increase in what we call program audits. Um, and it's not just H2B, what you see there, it's for H2A2 where the program audits are um, audits of to confirm that the attestation that employers made under these two applications or these two programs, um, those attestations are indeed truthful. And um, what will happen is the Department of Labor will issue a audit letter to the employer and ask for all of the recruitment activities that you attested to performing as part of the application process. You then have to present the uh, documentation of the newspaper ads, the recruitment report. Um, the Department of Labor can ask for additional information after the first request, and there are consequences of failing to respond, such as debarment from the program or revocation of the application that was certified. So it's really important for you to respond to them. Common violations that we've seen in some of these audits include situations where an employer hasn't provided the correct earning uh, earnings report, you have to show hours offered and hours worked. That is one of the most common violations I've seen. Also, um, unlawful deductions. If an employer deducts for tools or clothing and it wasn't noted in the work order that 
these were possible deductions, that's a violation of the program. And then, um, like I said, common violations we've seen in the H-2A program would be where the employer uh, failed to um, provide transportation or visa services or uh, fulfill the three-quarter guarantee. H-2B program, even though it's still effective or law, the Department of Labor cannot audit this, these requirements right now for the H-2B program. In addition to the program audits, the Wage and Hour Division has enforcement authority too, and that is through the USCIS. Um, the Immigration Service has delegated its authority to the Wage and Hour Division to enforce the obligations of the H-2A and H-2B program. The, the consequences of violations may be a finding of back wages or uh, unpaid wages, but also an employer can face civil money penalties in addition to those back wages or unpaid wages, and also a possible debarment. So that's the, the possible consequences for wage and hour division enforcement um, activities and very serious consequences. Um, it's really important to remember that Wage and Hour has jurisdiction beyond the program, um, the H-2B and H-2A program. It can look at any federal labor um, violations, uh, including the FLSA, the Migrant and Seasonal Agricultural Worker Prote Protection Act. So uh, once you get in a Wage and Hour division investigation, I would recommend that you never go through it pro se, meaning on your own. Um, we have seen many activities where employers have allowed managers to talk to Wage and Hour investigators when you're not required to. So it's really important to take these investigations seriously and make sure that you understand what your rights are and um, what procedures you should undertake when wage and hour appears at your work site. The scope and jurisdiction of a wage and hour investigation, as I mentioned, um, it can include your H-2A workers, but also U.S. workers and those working in corresponding employment, meaning J-1s too, uh, which are uh, exchange visitors. Um, employers often forget that. The investigations vary depending on the jurisdiction you're in. Um, an example of how they can work is wage and hour investigators can just show up and start interviewing your workers. They have the right to do that. They um, don't have to ask your permission. They will inform you, but they can just start um, they can just appear on site and start looking at your facilities. Um, again, I do not recommend um, employers speaking with them without counsel. Um, your employees, they can definitely speak to your employees, not management level employees um, without counsel. Um, they can also request documentation from you and some of the requests can be outside the um, jurisdiction of what they may have and that's why it's really important to uh, have counsel available to ensure that you're not providing documentation that's not required. The type of violations we've seen in wage and hour investigation is when um, wage and hour has determined that you have not conducted a fair test of the labor market and rejected U.S. workers when they should have been provided an opportunity to apply or continue in the uh, interview process. Um, findings such as not posting the uh, uh, posters, the H-2B and H-2A posters that are required, um, violations of housing requirements for the H-2B program are often issues that we see in the H-2A wage and hour investigation, and non-compliance with the recruitment requirements. Um, those are some of the violations we've seen. Um, other violations may be unlawful deductions. I'm not going to go in depth with every type of possible violations, but these are the ones that we see a lot, which uh, I mentioned previously, similar to the program audits where um, the earning records do not provide all the information that's required in the um, 
earning statements. Another violation that we've seen often is where um, workers are performing duties outside of the work contract. Um, babysitting is not allowed for H2B workers who are working at a carnival. Um, we've seen uh, situations where employers have been fined because of that or they're placed outside the area of intended employment. The working conditions have to be consistent with what is represented in the petition. I also want to uh, mention there is an increase in investigations by USCIS um, in addition to the wage and hour division investigations. USCIS is conducting on-site um, visits to H-2A and H-2B employers to confirm that all the representations that are noted in the H-2B petitions are being complied with, and that includes um, taking photos of work areas, interviewing the H-2A workers, um, confirming the information on the petition is consistent with uh, what is actually being performed and the positions uh, available. So um, it's really critical for you as an employer to make sure you keep track of your audit, um, audit files, meaning maintain them, um, make sure that your recruitment reports are in your audit files so when any of these investigative entities come on board, you have them ready and you know where to find them. Um, it's really critical to understand your rights as an employer and your employees understand their rights, but you never want to be in a position where you may be seen as um, being an impediment to an investigation, meaning you're obstructing the investigation. So it's really critical to be cooperative also with the request, but understand your rights too. I don't know if we've received any questions, um, Jenny. I don't think we have. Um, if you have any questions for us after this presentation, besides the one that we received, please feel free to email us or send it to us. Um, this program is meant to provide you with a broad overview of um, the H-2A and H-2B program and some of the um, trends that we see happening in regards to investigation and also uh, preparing for the 2020 season. So we wish everyone good luck with the H-2B season, specifically April 2020 here. And if you are interested in the H-2B program or the H-2A program and your need is in spring of 2020, this is now the time to start the process and getting in touch with um, us or your council to start the process. Um, we have seen situations where employers need workers and they come to us in December and they need H-2B workers and we have to let them know that it's really too late here and they can proceed with it, but there's just no guarantee that they're gonna get the workers the day they need. So thank you for joining us today, and um, we hope to see you in our next webinars coming up. Thank you.